copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Fresno County Sheriff's Office calling all cards. Attention all cards broadcast 248 regarding a missing person. Described as a male American, 72 years, 5 feet 8 inches, was last seen on March 22nd. Notify the Fresno County Sheriff. That's all. Rose and Quiz. I believe it's true, friends, that you get out of an automobile just about what you put into it. Fill your gas tank with a not-so-good gasoline, and how will your car perform? Not so good. Put in Rio Grande Cracked, and you get quicker starting, smoother acceleration, greater power, better mileage, and the top speed of which your car is capable, because all of these qualities are instilled into this superior gasoline. And that explains why a certain group of knowing drivers selected Rio Grande Cracked. They wanted a gasoline that had all five of these qualities. They tested every available brand and found that Rio Grande Cracked had everything. That is why more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment on the boulevards and highways of California today are powered by Rio Grande Cracked than any other brand. We are also proud of the fact that Rio Grande Cracked is the gasoline preferred by the heads of the California state and federal government. And equally happy that tens of thousands of your motorists have also chosen Rio Grande Cracked. If you've not done so, drop around at the red and white Rio Grande station in your neighborhood tomorrow and join the rest of us in getting police car performance with Rio Grande Cracked, the gasoline of the people and for the people, the most highly recommended gasoline sold in the West. The story we're to hear tonight has been taken from the confidential records on file in the office of Sheriff George Overholt of Fresno County. We have therefore asked Sheriff Overholt to prepare a foreword for our program. Circumstantial evidence is something that the average person has classified as an undesirable thing. Many have been to, led to believe that circumstantial evidence should not be used to convict a man of a felony. However, consider for a moment the many and varied stories that have been told in court by eyewitnesses to, to a crime and contrast those stories with the indisputable evidence of physical facts. It is significant that in the state of California, the death penalty has been assessed only twice on the basis of circumstantial evidence, and both those cases have come from Fresno County. Tonight's story is one of them, and although this case is still on appeal, there is little doubt but, what, but that the judgment of the trial court will be upheld. However, I shall reserve additional comment for the end of the program. <laughs> Sheriff's office. Overholt speaking. Uh, this is the County Welfare Bureau. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, we've just been out to the shack where old man Leek lives. He isn't there. Well, what do you want us to do? Well, I think you should investigate. The old man has been coming in regularly every week for the past couple of months. We haven't seen him now in two weeks. We sent one of our workers out today to see if anything had happened to him, and she reports that the shack seems pretty torn up. We're afraid something may have happened to the old man. All right, I'll put somebody on it. Is Jack Tower out there? Yeah, Sheriff, right here. Well, get John Ford and come in here. Oh. Deputy Ford and Tar made an inspection of the missing man's cabin, but found nothing to arouse their suspicion. They returned to the office to report their findings to Overholt. Well, Tar, what did you and Ford find out on that leak job? I don't know. I don't see anything to worry about. Looks to me like the old man just wandered off somewhere, and while he was gone, somebody broke into the joint. The place has been pretty well ransacked. We talked to some of the Mexicans living out there close to the brickyard, and none of them have seen the old man since sometime late in March. Well, I guess he'll turn up. Oh, by the way, Ford, you know a colored boy named Ray Davis? Oh, I don't think so. Why? Well, he was in here a while ago looking for you. Said he'd come back. There's a colored boy out there in the hall, but his name's Green. Well, call him in. Maybe he's the one. Come in here, Willie. Yes, sir. You want to see me? Yes, sir, Mr. Ford, I won't talk to you. All right, come on in here. Is this the boy, Sheriff? Yes, that's the fellow. I thought you told me your name was Ray Davis. Uh, yes, I did. Well, why don't you make up your mind what your name is? Oh, I can explain that. What's the trouble, Willie? Uh, you all know old man Leek lived out the brickyard. Leek? 
What about it? Well, there's something I think I ought to tell you about the old man. He done made me a proposition. What kind of a proposition? Well, he done made me a proposition to blow you fellas up. Huh? Huh? Blow who up? Uh, blow up the sheriff's office and all you fellas. Well, Mr. Ford and Mr. Tar, all of you. Well, what did you say about this proposition? I told him he's crazy. Well, when did all this happen? About a week ago. And just how are you going to do it? Well, the old man was going to get some dynamite and put it in a suitcase. And he told me to come up here and sit down out there in the hall and wait till you fellas was all in here. Then he told me I was to stick my cigarette on the fuse and just walk out. And what else? Well, he got five gallons of gasoline and some coal oil, and he wanted me to pour it on the Mexican shacks down there and burn them up, and the Mexicans in them. But, well, what was the idea of that? Well, he said them Mexicans been stealing some stuff out in this place, and besides, he wanted one of the houses that one of them was living in. And he figured if he was to burn up some of them, the others would leave. He said they'd been stealing dynamite out of the brickyard, too. Well, and what were you supposed to get out of this, Willie? Well, he's going to give me 300 bucks for the job. Give me a hundred. Oh, he gave you a hundred dollars? Where'd he get a hundred dollars? Oh, he had lots of money. Took it out of the bank. When? Oh, long time ago. Last year sometime, just had you fellas had him in jail here. He said he was going to leave town. Well, why didn't he? He said he wasn't going to leave till he got even with you fellas for arresting him that time when he's carrying him gun. I see. Well, what happened to this dynamite idea? Well, I wasn't going to do it no how, but I just told him I would. Mm-hmm. And where's the old man now? Don't know for sure, but, well, he said he'd write me a letter from San Francisco. He ain't come yet. Boy, I didn't know it was that late. I got to be getting over to the post office. I got a package coming in. Wait a minute, Willie. It's a nice watch you got there. Where'd you get it? Oh, I bought that Waltham when I was in Stockton two years ago. Sure is a fine watch, too. Well, this isn't a Waltham. This is a Hamilton watch, Willie. Well, yes, sir. That's what I said, Hamilton. You said Waltham. Eh, never mind. What makes you think you're going to get a letter from old man Leak? Oh, he just said he'd write to me. Well, you run along, and as soon as you hear from him, you let us know. We'd like to talk to him about that dynamite idea. I yes. sure do that, Mr. Ford, because I don't want to get mixed up with the law. I know crime don't pay. Uh, what made you decide that? In them seven years I put in San Quentin. All right, run along, Willie. Be sure you come back here when you get that letter. Yes, sir, Mr. Ford. And close that door. Yes. Well, what do you think? I don't know. I can't figure out why that boy came around here. Well, maybe he's telling the truth. Well, he probably is, but why did he want to come tell us the story? Well, maybe he thinks it's a good idea to stay on the side of law and order. Yeah, San Quentin does that for some guys. <laughs> oh, John, you know what he went up for? Burglary from Merced. Mm. Seems to be going straight now, though, as far as I can find out. And what does he do for a living? Oh, he paints a few signs. He's a pretty good sign painter. Washes and polishes cars, digs cisterns and cesspools and whatever else he can find. You think he'll come back when he gets the letter from the old man? If he doesn't, I'll slap him in the hoose, gal. <laughs> Two days later, on the 31st of March, Green again puts in an appearance at the sheriff's office. Well, Mr. Ford, I got the letter. That's so? Let's see it. Come on in the office. Yes, sir. Willie got his letter, Sheriff. Oh, that's so? Yeah. Now, let me read it. Hmm. Willie, are you sure Leek wrote this letter? Yes, sir. I'm pretty sure. Uh, why does he call you Ray Davis? Well, that's on count of the other letter in the package. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What letter and what package? The letter with the check in it. Maybe you better tell us about that one, Willie. Well, sir, the other day before Mr. Leek left, he, he called me over and he said to me, Willie, how'd you all like to go in business? What kind of business? Oh, you know, the, the sign painting business. Go on. Well, he said, uh, here's a $100 bill. Now, you take it and go buy yourself something. But don't cash that bill in Fresno. Because he'll get suspicious and start asking you questions. Uh, who is this that was going to get suspicious? Well, I don't know, but I, I reckon he meant you fellas here in the office. Well, what did you do with the $100 bill, huh? Uh, well, I put it in the envelope. No, no, I didn't. I'll give it to Mr. Lee. And he put it in the envelope and sent it to Montgomery Ward and opened it. Well, what did he do that for? Well, I wanted some records for my phonograph, so I marked off the records I wanted on the page in the catalog and gave it to Mr. Lee. He put it in the envelope and sent it off. And he told him to send it to Ray Davis. That's why I got in trouble over the post office. What kind of trouble? Well, when I went over there to ask for my letter, the lady, she say, wait a minute. And then she called up some fella, and he come down, and he say, is your name Ray Davis? 
And I says, yes, sir. And he says, you know anybody around here? And I says, yes, sir. I know Mr. Ford and the boys over at the sheriff's office. And he says, well, how come you send me a $100 bill after $4 worth of records? And I says, how come you all know that? And he said, well, they got speeches in the audit department at Montgomery Ward, and they call in the Secret Service men. Well, uh, what did you tell the man at the post office? Oh, I just told him that I didn't know no better and wanted to get the change. I thought you said Leek was going to give you $300 for this dynamite job you were going to do. Yes, sir. Yeah, he say something about that in the letter there. Well, he say he'd give me the other 200 when he read in the papers that I'd done the job. He say he'd make a lot of trouble for me, though, if I tells anybody about this. Wait a minute. That letter was sealed when you gave it to me a while ago. How does it happen you know what is in it? Well, I just guessed that that's what he's going to say. Well, you did some pretty close guessing, Willie. So that's exactly what this letter does say. Tom, would you bring me Leek's fingerprint card? Yeah, right away. Willie, when did you tell me that you saw Leek the last time? About a week ago. You mean last Saturday? Uh, yes, sir, sometime around there. Well, was it before Saturday or after? Must have been at a Saturday, because it, it was after that that I was back from San Francisco. And I was in San Francisco on the Sunday. So it must have been after that. No, sir. I believe it was the Sunday before that. Here's the old man's card, Sheriff. Uh, here, Willie. Write Ray Davis on this sheet of paper. Uh, take a look at this card, John. See any similarity between this handwriting and this letter of leaks that Willie has? No, not very much. Here's that piece of paper, Sheriff. Oh, thank you, Willie. Well, what do you think, John? I think you've got something worth looking into. You all through with me, Mr. Ford? Uh, stick around a while, Willie. We might want some more information. Uh, yes. Sheriff, I've just been out taking up a... Well, what's that guy doing in here? He brought us a letter that he got from Leak today. Oh, he did, huh? Look, Willie, how'd you like to run over and get me a package of cigarettes? Sure, I'd be glad, Mr. Tarr. All right. Here's four bits. Get something for yourself, too. Yes, sir. I'll be right back. No hurry. How come you're getting so generous all of a sudden? I wanted to get him out of here. I didn't want him to be suspicious. Well, why should he be suspicious? Well, that Martin and I just got back from checking over old man Leek's place, talking to some of the neighbors out there. According to the dope we got, the last man seen with old man Leek was Willie Green. And that was on the night of March 19th. Well, now, now just wait a minute. John, didn't Willie tell us he was in San Francisco on the 20th? Yes, he did. Well, maybe he was. But here's something else. Well, what's that? A little item we found close to the railroad track out near the brickyard. A pair of overalls, huh? Bloody torn overalls. But I'll bet my bottom dollar belonged to old man Leek. Well, where'd you find them? Exactly 351 feet from the edge of Potter's Field. You see, the pockets have been cut out and the buckles torn off. Found these buckles 92 feet farther toward the graveyard than the overalls were. Well, this is beginning to add up to something. What do you think? I don't know. Ed Martin's got a bunch of men going over the ground out there by the brickyard. I've got a hunch that out there somewhere we're going to find old man Leek's body. Well, how about this letter he wrote Willie Green? I don't know, but I'm sure going to find out. Well, uh, what kind of cigarette you all wore, Mr. Tarr? You didn't tell me. I, uh, I never mind, Willie. Come on in. I want to have a talk with you. Yes, sir. Willie, when did you see old man Leek last? I think it must have been around the middle of the month. Mm -hmm. And what time did you go to San Francisco last week? Well, I left here Saturday morning and stopped off Merced, and then I got a freight train out of Merced. Got in San Francisco about midnight. Midnight, huh? Where'd you stay? A little hotel down close to SP Depot. You remember the name of the place? No, sir, but I can find it for you. Willie, are you sure you didn't see old man Leek last Saturday night? Yes, sir, I'm sure. Where was he the last time you saw him? He's down there by the creek. Uh, He's down there by the creek, uh, close to the bridge. Uh, all right. Go on out and get those cigarettes. Uh, yes, sir. Well, what do you think? I don't know. There's a bare possibility that the old man may have wandered off down there and tumbled into that canal. Oh, for the love of Mike, don't tell me we're going to have to drag that canal again. No, but we're sure going to have a look at every foot of it. Working on the theory that the missing man may have fallen into the stream or that he might have been killed and his body placed in the water, the officers began a systematic inspection of the canal. Fearful lest grappling hooks might miss or destroy some valuable clue, the officers determined to pump the water from the pit. 
Hour after hour, the steady throb of the pumps lowered the level of the water. At last, objects on the bottom became visible. In the clear water of the pit, the deputies found their first important lead. Well, boys, what did you find? Plenty. I think we've got pretty good evidence that old man Leak is dead. Well, Since that old man Leak is dead. Oh, well, that's so? Come on in here, Sheriff. Bill Morton's got the stuff in his laboratory. Oh, uh, John, bring that record card of old man Leak, will you? Here's the stuff we got out of the pit, George. Here's a coat, a set of keys, and a pair of glasses. Here's the card, Jack. Oh, thanks. See this right temple on old man Leak's glasses? Yeah, it's got a rubber tube on it, hasn't it? Yeah. With the guys that repair radio sets call spaghetti. You see that crooked nose piece? Uh-huh. Now, take a look at these glasses we found in the gravel pit. Yeah, they're the same ones, aren't they? Yep. Those are old man Leak's glasses. They took these keys out and dried them in the old man's car. And they fit. So, it looks like we've got another murder on our hands. Yep. And no body. Well, maybe not. But we've got an A number one suspect. You mean Willie? Yep. Willie Green. Yeah. Mr. Todd, yeah? you never did tell me what kind of cigarettes you all want. Oh, well, that's all right, Willie. Come on in. We won't need any cigarettes now. We're going to be busy. Yes, sir. What do it? Finding out why you killed old man Leak and what you did with his body. Convinced now that a murder had been committed, officers began questioning Willie Green. Suddenly, grown sullen and defiant, Green could not or would not account for his movements immediately preceding the disappearance of the murdered man. Time after time, he changed his story, each time becoming more involved than before. At last, he refused to answer any questions, but carefully worded conversations which the officers held between themselves would from time to time goad him into fresh admissions or denials. He stoutly maintained at all times that Leap was not dead, but was in hiding. Then, on the 4th of April, Sheriff Overholt and his deputies again determined to search the neighborhood of Leak's home. Now, just where have you boys been looking for Leak's body? Well, we figured that if anybody was going to kill a man and bury the body, and choose the place that wasn't visible from all points. Well, that's reasonable, all right. Well, we've been down in the hollow there, close to the Mexican houses, and over here in this low place beyond the railroad and down in that dump heap there. Well, that might work for an ordinary person. What do you mean? Did it ever occur to you that Willie did some pretty clever maneuvering when he came around to us before we knew anything had happened to Leak? Yeah, I thought it was funny at the time. All right. Now, let's assume that he isn't figuring like an ordinary man. Or else that he's just plain foolhardy. Let's go over this ground again. This time, let's look for the high places. Hmm. Now, according to what we found out before, you boys found some blood stains down by the railroad track there, didn't you? Yep, that's right. All right, let's go a little further down the line and see what we can find. All right. Yeah, a guy'd have to be touched in the head to try to bury a body up here. No, I don't think our murderer is touched in the head, Jack. I think he's a very clever man. Well, there have been times when Willie Green showed signs of being clever. We haven't convicted Willie Green of this murder yet, John. Did you boys look under that pile of junk over there? No, we didn't. There's no time like the present. Well, here. Let's move these old fenders. All right. Well, George, this looks like the place, all right. I'm afraid it is. Opposite the 13th grave. Let's get a couple of fellows over here and do a little digging. Within a few minutes, the loose sand revealed the gruesome fact that the missing man had indeed been murdered. The brutally beaten and crushed body of John Leak was taken from its shallow grave. Fingerprint examination by Deputy Mortland definitely established the identity of the murdered man. Meantime, Deputy Sheriffs had been checking Willie Green's story of his trip to San Francisco and of his last meeting with John Leak. Their findings reported, Green is again brought in for questioning. Willie, how does it happen that you told us that you were in San Francisco on March 20th? When, as a matter of fact, you were in Fresno on that date, weren't you? No, sir. I wasn't in Fresno. I was in San Francisco. Mr. Martin here tells me different. How about it, Ed? We checked all the rooming houses around the depot in San Francisco, and we found the place where Green stayed when he was there. It was on the night of the 26th and not the night of the 19th and 20th. That ain't so. We found a woman who runs a restaurant close to the hotel. And when we showed her pictures of Willie, she recognized him as the man who'd been there, buying chicken dinners for all the crowd on Saturday night, the 26th. I didn't buy no chicken dinner. She told us that Willie showed her several hundred-dollar bills, and he told her he got them from his sister back in Chicago and that his sister owned some oil wells. Uh, how about that, Willie? 
Well, I never told him nothing of the kind. Jack and I checked with the bank where old man Leek did his business, and they tell us that about a year ago, the old man drew $5,000 out of a savings account. Most of it in $100 bills, and some of it in $10 gold pieces. Uh, what did you do with the gold, Willie? I ain't never had no gold, except what I mined when I was up at the SERA camp. We uh, checked up on that Merced angle. We found that Willie had been there, and he paid a woman where he used to live some back room rent. She said that he took the money out of a wallet. And that the name on the wallet was Leak. She's lying. Don't like me, that's all. What kind of a watch do you own, Willie? A watch, no matter I told you once. Besides, you ought to know you took it away from me. Uh, you mean this watch? Yeah, that's the one. They took it away from me when they locked me up. But this watch is a Hamilton. So what? I should call it a Walter. Wait a minute. Let's see that record card of old man Leak. Uh, here it is. Now look, George. Here's a list of the property that the old man had on him when we picked him up last year. Uh-huh. I see. Where did you get this watch, Willie? I bought it from a little jewelry store in Stockton two, year, two years ago, right close to the courthouse. And you call it a Waltham, huh? Yeah. Well, part of the property of old man Leak, the part of it that's missing, was a Waltham watch. So what? And this Hamilton watch is clean inside. It hasn't been carried any two years. Well, that don't prove nothing. Maybe not. But I'll lay you a little bet that before I'm through, it'll prove that you killed old man Leak. From the file of the previous case involving the murdered man, officers learned that the missing watch had been purchased from a jeweler in Coalinga. Accordingly, they took the watch which Green claimed he had purchased in Stockton to the jeweler for examination. Good morning, Mr. Petty. You know Deputy Martin, don't you? Yeah, why, well, sure. Hi, Ed. Fine. Uh, Mr. Petty, we've got a watch we want you to look over. See if you have any record of ever having cleaned it. Ah, here it is. Yeah, it's a good-looking watch. Just a minute, let me look inside the case. All right. No, I never had this watch in here, but here's a number that indicates that the watch was repaired in 1936 by a jeweler at the Army Post in the Presidio in San Francisco. 1936? Uh, he might be able to tell you something about it. Well, okay, thanks. We'll, we'll check with him. Now, you do repair work for most of the fellas here in the post, don't you? Well, as much of it as I can get. I see. You ever see this watch before? Well, let me look at it. Hmm. Yes, I repaired this watch about, uh... Oh, I guess... Oh, wait a minute. Let me see. In August, 1936. Well, fine. Uh, wait a minute. I've got his name right here. Uh, yes, here it is. Joe Gilbert, Company F. Joe Gilbert, huh? You are sure it was 1936? Well, certainly. Here's the date right here. Well, that's fine. Now, look, uh, can you tell whether that watch was ever repaired in Stockton? Why, well, yes, if the repairman put his initial on it. But I don't see anything on it here that indicates that. Okay, thanks. I think we'll go over and see Mr. Gilbert. <laughs> Mr. Gilbert, I'm trying to find out something about the history of this watch. You ever seen it before? Why, sure. That, that used to be my watch. I gave it to Louis Edwards. I owed him six bucks. He was discharged, and I didn't have any cash, so I gave him the watch. Well, do you know where Louis Edwards is now? No, but he used to live up at Oroville. Good morning, sir. Are you Mr. Edwards? Yes, sir. That's my name. Well, I'm trying to get in touch with Louis Edwards. You uh, know where I could find him? What do you want with him? Well, I've got a watch here that he used to own, and I'm trying to trace the place where he sold it. Is he in any kind of trouble? Oh, no. No, he's not. I just want to find out where this watch has been since he sold it. Well, I don't know where he is right now. He was working for a man down on F Street in Bakersfield the last time I heard from him. I see. Well, thanks. Oh, uh, if you hear from him, yeah. ask him to get in touch with the sheriff's office in Fresno, will you? <laughs> I oh, know. Edwards ain't been here for three or four months, I guess. He said he was going down to visit a brother of his in Compton. No, Louis hasn't been here for a month or more, I guess. He's down at Jack's place in Palm Springs. He's another brother. Nope, Louis's not here. Haven't seen him since he came down from Bakersfield. Said he was going to live with Gene over in Compton. Yeah, but Gene hasn't seen him for a month. Well, you might try the family again. They moved up to Marysville. Okay. 
No, Flora hasn't been home, but you might come in any day now. Just as soon as he does, I'll get in touch with you. Faced with the seemingly hopeless task of finding the man who had previously owned the watch, Under Sheriff Tarr returned to Fresno. Then, in company with other officers, they attempted to trace the watch through the records of the San Francisco Police Department in the hope that those records might show the purchase by the suspected man. Again, they were faced with the impossible task of checking thousands of records with insufficient information upon which to base their search. Then, one day, from Marysville, word came from Louis Edwards, giving the name and address of a pawn shop giving the name and address of a pawn shop in San Francisco where the watch had been sold less than a year before. Immediately, Deputy Martin and Tar contacted the pawnbroker. Now, look, I, I've got a watch here that's supposed to have been sold by this shop. I say, weren't you the fellows in here the other day? No, but we've been in every other hawk shop in San Francisco. Well, let me look at that watch. Well, I don't know. It'll take me a long time to check all my records. Well, I have a sneaking suspicion you won't have to look very far. Because I believe that this watch was bought here between the 15th of last month and the 1st of this month. All right, let's start looking with March 15th. I think you can get it farther down than that, Jack. We know that Green was in Fresno the night of the 19th. Let's start with the 20th. Okay, the 20th it is. 20th, no Hamilton. 21st, no Hamilton. 22nd, no Hamilton. 23rd, no Hamilton. No Hamilton. None in the 24th, 25th, no. 26th, no. 27th. How about a Waltham? Waltham? What about it? I bought a Waltham on the 27th, and I traded a Hamilton, a 21 jewel watch for it, and got a $10 gold piece in trade. Are you sure of that? Positive. You can see for yourself. I sold this Hamilton watch to a young colored man, weighed about uh, 150 pounds, 5 feet 8 inches, according to the sales slip. Here's his name, Ray Davis. I got a gold-faced Waltham watch and a $10 gold piece. You say, wait a minute, there's no trouble about this watch, is there? Is there? Huh? Oh, oh no, no, not very much. Just a fella got murdered for it, that's all. All right, Willie. Now I want the truth about old man Leek. I done told you all the truth. Oh, no, you haven't. You told us that Leek wrote your letter on the 27th day of March. That's right. Well, Leek was dead on the 23rd of March, Willie, and buried. Are you all know that? Because, Willie, it rained on the 23rd day of March, and the grave where we found old man Leek had been rained on. Besides, the handwriting on that letter and the handwriting on the jeweler sales slip where you bought that watch, and on the envelope when you ordered the records, the handwriting is all the same. Well, it ain't mine. And all those specimens of handwriting are the same as that on the letters you wrote when you were in San Quentin. Now, what about it, Willie? I ain't talking. I said no. Yes, Willie, I'm afraid you have. You've said too much. As a matter of fact, it's going... As a matter of fact, it's going to hang you. In just a moment, Sheriff Overholt will tell us additional facts regarding tonight's story. But just a reminder, friends, just as you think of police car performance, Rio Grande cracked gasoline, whenever you hear the shrill cry of sirens, will you do this? When you need an oil change, think of Real Lube, the stronger, smoother lubricant that can't break down. For Real Lube is justly known as the newest and finest motor oil sold in the West. And now, Sheriff Overholt. On purely circumstantial evidence, Willie Green was brought to trial, and in exactly 55 minutes, a jury returned a verdict of guilty. The evidence of the watch was the most conclusive of all, and Green received the death sentence as payment for his crime. Thank you, Sheriff Overholt. Office calling all cards, attention all cards, cancellation broadcast 248 regarding a missing person. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Rose and Willie. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley.